Page number 56. Chapter 5. Papachi's Moth by Arundhati Roy. Guess the meaning of the following expressions from the context. Ignominy of retirement. Slouch around. Sullen circles. Taxonomic reshuffle. Pernicious ghost. Conical corneas. Weaving. Entomologist. Lepidopterists. Mamachi had started making pickles commercially soon after Papachi retired from government service in Delhi and came to live in Ayamenam. The Kottayam Bible Society was having a fair and asked Mamachi to make some of her famous banana jam and tender mango pickle. It sold quickly and Mamachi found that she had more orders than she could cope with. Thrilled with her success, she decided to persist with the pickles and jam and soon found herself busy all year round. Papachi, for his part, was having trouble coping with the ignominy of retirement. He was 17 years older than Mamachi and realized with a shock that he was an old man when his wife was still in her prime. Though Mamachi had conical corneas and was already practically blind, Papachi would not help her with the pickle making because he did not consider pickle making a suitable job for a high ranking ex government official. He had always been a jealous man, so he greatly resented the attention his wife was suddenly getting. He slouched around the compound in his immaculately tailored suits, weaving sullen circles around mounds of red chilies and freshly powdered yellow turmeric watching Mamachi supervise the buying, the weighing, the salting and drying of limes and tender mangoes. Page number 57 Every night he beat her with a brass flower vase. The beatings weren't new. What was new was only the frequency with which they took place. One night Papachi broke the bow of Mamachi's violin and threw it in the river. Then Chako came home for a summer vacation from Oxford. He had grown to be a big man and was, in those days, strong from rowing for Balliol. A week after he arrived, he found Papachi beating Mamachi in the study. Chako strode into the room, caught Papachi's vase hand and twisted it around his back. I never want this to happen again, he told his father. Ever! For the rest of that day, Papachi sat in the veranda and stared stonily out at the ornamental garden, ignoring the plates of food that Kuchumarya brought him. Late at night, he went into his study and brought out his favourite mahogany rocking chair. He put it down in the middle of the driveway and smashed it into little bits with a plumber's monkey wrench. He left it there in the moonlight, a heap of varnished wicker and splintered wood. He never touched Mamachi again, but he never spoke to her either as long as he lived. When he needed anything, he used Kuchumaria or baby Kochamma as intermediaries. In the evenings, when he knew visitors were expected, he would sit on the veranda and sew buttons that weren't missing onto his shirts to create the impression that Mamachi neglected him. To some small degree, he did succeed in further corroding Ayamanam's view of working wives. He bought the sky blue Plymouth from an old Englishman in Munnar. He became a familiar sight in Ayamanam, coasting importantly down the narrow road in his wide car, looking outwardly elegant, but sweating freely inside his woolen suits. He wouldn't allow Mamachi or anyone else in the family to use it or even to sit in it. The Plymouth was Papachi's revenge. Papachi had been an imperial entomologist at the Pusa Institute. After independence, when the British left, his designation was changed from imperial entomologist to joint director entomology. Page number 58. The year he retired, he had risen to a rank equivalent to director. His life's greatest setback was not having had the moth that he had discovered named after him. It fell into his drink one evening while he was sitting in the veranda of a rest house after a long day in the field. 
As he picked it out, he noticed its unusually dense dorsal tufts. He took a closer look. With growing excitement, he mounted it, measured it, and the next morning placed it in the sun for a few hours for the alcohol to evaporate. Then he caught the first train back to Delhi. To taxonomic attention and, he hoped, fame. After six unbearable months of anxiety, to Papachi's intense disappointment, he was told that his moth had finally been identified as a slightly unusual race of a well-known species that belonged to the tropical family, Lyman Tree Day. The real blow came 12 years later, when, as a consequence of a radical taxonomic reshuffle, Lepidopterists decided that Papachi's moth was in fact a separate species and genus hitherto unknown to science. By then, of course, Papachi had retired and moved to Imanim. It was too late for him to assert his claim to the discovery. His moth was named after the acting director of the Department of Entomology, a junior officer whom Papachi had always disliked. Being ill humored long before he discovered the moth, Papachi's moth was held responsible for his black moods and sudden bouts of temper. Its pernicious ghost, grey, furry, and with unusually dense dorsal tufts, haunted every house that he ever lived in. It tormented him and his children and his children's children. Until the day he died, even in the stifling Iamanum heat, Every single day, Papachi wore a well-pressed three-piece suit and his gold pocket watch. On his dressing table, next to his cologne and silver hairbrush, he kept a picture of himself as a young man, with his hair slicked down, taken in a photographer's studio in Vienna, where he had done the six-month diploma course that had qualified him to apply for the post of imperial entomologist. It was during those few months they spent in Vienna that Mamachi took her first lessons on the violin. Page number 59 The lessons were abruptly discontinued when Mamachi's teacher, Lonsky Typhenthal, made the mistake of telling Papachi that his wife was exceptionally talented and, in his opinion, potentially concert class. Mamachi pasted in the family photograph album the clipping from the Indian Express that reported Papachi's death. It said, Noted entomologist Sri Benan John Ipe, son of late Reverend E. John Ipe of Imanam, popularly known as Punyan Kunju, suffered a massive heart attack and passed away at the Kottayam General Hospital last night. He developed chest pains around 1.5 a.m. and was rushed to hospital. The end came at 2.45 a.m. Sri Aib had been keeping indifferent health since last six months. He is survived by his wife, Shoshama, and two children. At Papachi's funeral, Mamachi cried and her contact lenses slid around in her eyes. Ammu told the twins that Mamachi was crying more because she was used to him than because she loved him. She was used to having him slouching around the pickle factory and was used to being beaten from time to time. Ammu said that human beings were creatures of habit and it was amazing the kind of things they could get used to. You only had to look around you, Ammu said to see that beatings with brass vases were the least of them. About the author, Arundhati Roy, an architect by training, is a novelist and screenwriter. Her first novel, The God of Small Things, from which this extract has been selected, is the winner of the 1997 Booker Prize, a prestigious literary award. She now lives in New Delhi and is an activist. Page number 60. Understanding the text. 1. Comment on the relationship shared by Mamachi and Papachi. 2. How does Mamachi stand out as an independent and resilient woman in the text? 3. Why does John Ipe consider retirement to be a dishonour? 4. What was the underlying reason for John Ipe's disgust with the world? Talking about the text. Discuss in pairs. 
1. Chaco's firmness in dealing with the irrational behaviour of his father. 2. The contrast between the outward elegance of a person and his private behaviour. 3. Approval from the outside world and approval within the family. Appreciation 1. How does the author succeed in raising crucial social issues not through open criticism but through subtle suggestion? 2. Within a few pages, the author has packed the important events in the lives of John Ipe and his wife. Discuss how conciseness and economy of expression can achieve effective portrayal of entire lives. 3. Identify instances of ironical comment in the story. Language work 1. Entomologist and Lepidopterist are mentioned in the text and you must have guessed the meanings of these words or found them out from the dictionary. Now match the kinds of scientists with the work they do. Column A. Ornithologist, Gerontologist, Ergonomist, Dermatologist, Cytologist. Column B. Study of the skin. Study of cells. Page number 61. Study of birds. Study of old age. Study of design of equipment. 2. A short report announcing the death of a person in a newspaper is called an obituary. Where would you find the following? A citation. An epitaph. A glossary. An abstract. A postscript. Necessity is said to be the mother of invention. Listen to this piece on the invention of the Braille system to help the visually impaired. Reading for the Blind Until 1819, learning material for the blind was provided by using letters of the alphabet made of wood, lead, twigs or sometimes pins arranged in large pincushions. The Royal Institute for Young Blind Persons in Paris used three-inch deep letters made from cloth. In 1918, a ten-year-old blind boy named Louis Braille enrolled at the Institute. It was around this time that Captain Barbier de la Serre devised an alphabet of raised dots and dashes embossed on strips of cardboard. He called it night writing because soldiers could use it to read with their fingertips when in action at night. His system, however, was not a success because it was too complicated. It used an arrangement of 12 dots to each letter. Braille, now a teenager, became interested in this system. He simplified it and developed the present internationally used Braille system.